welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 28. Joining me today is the author of several books set in the 17th century, including The Lady's Slipper and A Divided Inheritance, and also three books set during the Second World War. It's these latter books that we will be focusing on today. They are Past Encounters, The Occupation, and the forthcoming The Lifeline. Hello, Deborah Swift. Hello, nice to be here. How are you? I'm really well. I'm enjoying my quiet time at home and it's Saturday, it's just getting dark and I'm feeling it's great to chat to somebody, even if it's only online. (laughs) I'm very happy to talk to you and uh, I've got my lights on, so I'm feeling a bit more daylight here. It's good. Good. So I wanted to start with some general questions. I noticed you write poetry. Yes, I love my poetry. In fact, I've just been listening to something on Radio 4, The Poetry Pharmacy. And it came out as a podcast and I've really enjoyed listening to that in the last few weeks. I'm a big poetry fan and used to write poetry a lot before I did my MA in creative writing, at which point I turned into a novelist sort of by accident. When I was supposed to be writing a poem, I ended up writing a bit of prose and then it grew and grew and became, in the end, a book. So I've always had a bit of a a sort of love for poetry. And recently I've just downloaded one of Simon Armitage's poetry books as well to listen to on audible so yeah big poetry fan oh that's fantastic do you think you might ever release a collection of poetry it's possible i mean i have had a few pamphlets published and things published in magazines and things like that and i suppose at some point i might get around to putting it together into a collection that was my intention when i went and did my ma in creative writing was to actually put the poems into something that resembled a book But as I say, I got sidetracked and so that never happened. But it might in the future and I might go back to writing short form things. But at the moment, I'm sort of so involved with writing these great long books that there's not much time left. I keep scribbling down ideas and thinking, oh, yes, that would make a poem. But I haven't got around to doing it yet. So I think when I do eventually get back to it, there'll be stacks and stacks and stacks of ideas that need working on. And it might be a few years before I get around to making a book out of it. It would be exciting if you did. I mean, obviously, we're talking about your novels today. But when I saw that you wrote poetry, I hadn't known before. I was like, oh, brilliant. It's sort of interesting because writing the poems and writing the books, they're such different skills. With a poem, you're trying to hone everything down to the absolute minimum bare bones. And with a novel, you're trying to give people much more information. They're sort of quite opposite in terms of their skills. I think they're both really interesting. And I love my poetry. I think it's It's a fantastic tool for really getting into people's hearts. And I tend to use my poetic skills, if you like, in those scenes where there's a lot of emotion. You don't want to be gushing, but you want to actually try and nail it in a few small lines. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I could talk about this for ages. It is great, but we're going to have to move on. You used to work as a costume and set designer for stage and television. And I was wondering what productions you worked on. I worked on quite a few productions in the North West Theatre, so that was where I was based, around Manchester, Liverpool and places in the North and in Scotland. So I worked on a big range of productions from Shakespeare to really modern plays like Alan Akebourne and things like that. And what I loved about theatre is it's so varied and the actual design can be so different depending on the director's ideas. So it's very much a collaborative thing so if the director wants to work in a certain way say he wants to make something really up to the minute he might move your setting from where it is in the actual text to somewhere new so it's always quite varied and yeah I did a lot of different designs while I was working so I was 20 years doing that work and it was fascinating and never dull. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So did your work there influence any of the stories you've written? I don't think it did directly, but it's indirectly it did a lot. Dealing as a designer, you have to read the text and analyse the text and work out what's going to work best for the setting for the play. And that often involves working out the sort of entrances and exit points of where characters are going to come in and out, where the stairs are going to be, where the doors are going to be. And it's made me very conscious of these as a writer, that when I'm setting up scenes in a book, I'm actually setting up scenes as if I'm a designer. So the hallway might only have two doors and that will make it more claustrophobic than if it had six doors, for example. Or you might need six doors if you've got lots of people coming in and out and you want to make a lot of 
activity happening in the scene. So I'm always very aware of how the physicality of where you set something affects the whole of the action that goes on in the scene. And so I sort of treat that a bit like a designer does. So yeah, that's affected that. But also just the visual thing of always being really aware of what people look like and how they move and how their costumes affect how they move. For example, in Past Encounters, which I know we're going to talk about, it was the 1940s where clothes were quite skimpy because of rationing and skirts were very narrow and it made you move in a particular way. And I was sort of very aware of that when I was describing people walking in and out of rooms, that this is what they look like. And although it's hard to convey those things in words, they're always there sort of influencing you in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, your books are wonderfully detailed. But you saying that there, I mean, my inner theatre studies from school is coming out here. I want to read a few paragraphs of your books again and, and see where these influences come in. But yeah, I mean, we have got to get on to your books proper as such. So I will say, listeners, Past Encounters sees Rhoda and Peter's marriage on the rocks. They haven't been close since before the war, and Rhoda finds evidence that Peter is meeting another woman. This woman turns out to be Helen, the wife of Peter's best friend, Archie, and Rhoda's never heard of either of them. A decade previously, when they were engaged, Peter struggled as a prisoner of war and Rhoda began an affair with one of the crew working on Brief Encounter. And I'll give you the brief summary of the occupation as well. In a tale on a different island, we have the occupation about Jersey in the war. Celine and Fred own a bakery. Fred is German and commanded to fight for his country and Celine has to muddle through the coming change to her life. Alongside her is Rachel, her friend, who is Jewish. So we better start with Past Encounters, Deborah, and you've got a reading for us. I have, yes. I thought I'd read some of Peter's uh, experiences as a prisoner of war, partly because this was one of the reasons I wanted to write this book, because prisoners of war, there are not many books written about them. And many men went through this ordeal of being captured by the enemy and having to wait sometimes as long as five years to be released. And their experiences were fascinating and also quite sad because when they came home, people were very reluctant to talk about it because they hadn't actually fought during the war. Or if they had fought, they had lost. And this led to quite a lot of shame and people not wanting to talk about their experiences but I thought it was a something that should be looked into and it was one of the main reasons I wrote the book. This section is quite near the end of the book where they're going to be moved from their prison of war camp onto something called the Long March which I'm sure we might talk about a bit later but I'll read this which is set in 1945 and the point of view character is Peter. Is it true we're moving again Archie said breathlessly, leaning over Peter's bunk. Guess so. Peter had already sensed something amiss because the Germans were scattered, their attention here and there. But they were still armed and even less predictable, so nobody took chances. But it's minus something out there, Archie said. Oh, poor baby, then take your vest, Harry said. Hey, George, can I team up with you? George Henderson, who was in the next bay, leaned round the corner and said, Sure, we're best to stick together. Peter exchanged a rueful look with Archie. They'd already arranged to team up with George, too. He knew neither of them particularly wanted Harry's company, but could hardly protest. George was talking. One of the men in number four has a radio. I've just heard they're saying some of our men got away in Berlin, even in this weather. They went in with the Romanians and they spoke good Czech, so they managed to get out to the Allied lines. Once we're out of this compound, you never know, we might see an opportunity. Archie called to him, maybe. He turned back to Peter. We're not for trying anything though, are we? Not until we know what'll happen or where they're taking us. It'd be stupid to try anything dangerous now. Oh yes, we mustn't try anything dangerous, Harry said, overhearing. That's why we joined the bleeding army, ain't it? Oh, lay off, Harry, Archie snapped. Peter ignored them. Their constant bickering was getting to him. George called out. I'm getting ready. If the rumour's right and we have to move, it'll be in a hurry. Why are they moving us? Harry asked. Man in Hut 7 says the Soviets are making headway on the Eastern Front. 
they've got Jerry on the run. Oh, all just rumours, thought Peter. He said, we don't know anything. It's just hearsay. Three and a bit years we've been stuck in this camp. What's going to change now? Archie sat down on Peter's bunk. That's not like you. It's usually you geeing me up. Guess I'm brassed off. Every time we move, we just seem to get further away from home and no nearer the end of the war. I feel numb, like there's no man left inside me, that I'm just an empty body walking around, going wherever Jerry tells me to go. I know, Archie said. Numb sounds good. I'm scared, Pete. I worry about what will happen if the Soviets get here first before the Yanks. I'm not sure whether they're part of the Geneva Convention or not, and I wouldn't put it past them to finish us off rather than hand us over. Less trouble. Peter turned to look at the rest of the mud-spattered window to the icy landscape outside. Maybe he'd become institutionalised. Here was a world they knew. Not a comfortable world, granted, one of hunger, fear and humiliation. But at least they knew the rules and they'd survived so far. They'd followed the turning of the year, the sowing, the planting and the harvesting. And the earth here seemed as if it was their earth, even though they'd dug it for the Germans. There was something reliable about nature, about things growing, about the weather. Out there was an unknown quantity. I don't know how you do it, but you managed to take awful situations and make them incredibly readable. That's interesting. I think one of the things that made it much easier was I think you have to get a sort of a distant perspective on it. And in past encounters, I used two different points of view to try and distance us a little bit from the horrors of what people had to go through in the war. So the point of view of Rhoda is in the first person, which is very intimate, and she's in a domestic setting, and it's all about her life there, whereas Peter's is much more broad, and we need to sort of be able to see the whole picture and then zone in through third person, narrow point of view, to see what it is that moves him or how he feels about it but I think it's also important to be able to get a sort of wide view and I think I use that that's one of the techniques I like to use which I've sort of got from the theatre and I think it's really interesting the two battles that are going on in the book are Peter's very obvious battle with the people who've captured him and are treating him really appallingly and Rhoda's battle which is how do you just keep going when you've got no information and the war's dragging on and on and you're in a situation that you don't particularly want to be in? And that was a whole different tension. And I wanted to really bring out those two different tensions in the, in the way it was written. Uh-huh. I'm going to have to ask then, who came first, Peter or Rhoda? I think Rhoda came first. I mean, one of the reasons she came first was because I live in Carnforth, which is where the book is set. And one of the things that I found fascinating was that our local railway station was the place where they filmed Brief Encounter. And that was supposed to be one of the most romantic films ever filmed in Britain. And there's a a museum there which has artefacts associated with the film. And I became rather fascinated by this idea that this film had been made just down the road from where I lived. So I investigated it a bit and found that there was somebody who'd gone to be an extra in the film who also worked on the station bookstore. And I thought, well, that's a fascinating thing. I'd like to investigate that. And so Rhoda's character grew out of that idea. And from some interviews that I did with people who had been there and had lived through the filming, and could tell me a bit more about it. And so her character grew out of this idea that she was on the bookstore and her life was quite mundane. And then all of a sudden the film crew arrive and they're from London because the North at that point was very much an industrial place, lots of iron works. There was a a lot of railway workings at Carnforth. And these people arriving from the South who were all well-fed, well-dressed, had a sort of fascination for Rhoda. And that was what interested me, was what effect would this have on this person? And also she was waiting for her fiancé, Peter, to come back from the war. And of course he wasn't going to come back for five years because he'd been captured and taken to a prisoner of war camp. 
and she didn't hear much from him in all that time. So it was sort of interesting to consider what that might have felt like, that you are engaged to somebody, but you haven't seen them for a few years. They're somewhere in a prison camp in Poland. You don't know where it is or what's happening there. And then this amazing film crew arrive with all these glamorous people dressed in fancy furs and they arrive in your local town and it's very tempting to have an affair and I thought oh that would be make a good story. That sounds like a ton of research to get there that's <laughs> really interesting. Yes I realise I've sort of wandered off the point quite a bit there but it's interesting how one thing leads to another and I think that's the way stories work that you start with one idea and then that idea blossoms out into a lot of other ideas and before you know it you're sort of caught up in this web that you have to somehow manufacture into a tale that people can read and and enjoy finding their way through. Mm -hmm. Well obviously we can see the reality of Peter's situation in the world war and how it would have been for people really but I had no idea that Rhoda was just herself not only Brief Encounter was based on fact but the character of Rhoda is based on some fact as well. Yes, I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about Past Encounters was that I could interview people and it was one of the attractions of writing about World War II for me was that it's just on the edge of our memory. It's just about to go out of our living memory. So I could interview people who were actually present on the railway station during the filming and I could also talk to people who'd lived through the war, which gave me quite a lot of material for Rhoda and also gave me quite a lot of material for Peter. And I was really impressed with the way people let me into their houses, allowed me to interview them, which always took ages, a lot longer than we thought while we had cups of tea and them sharing memories with me and maybe photographs. So Rhoda's character was constructed really from, from real interviews and that was something that I couldn't do with the lifeline because I couldn't travel across to Norway to finish off my research. Although I planned to do that, lockdown came and I could no longer do that. So I was stuck with it. <laughs> well, it works out. You said about Carnful Station and your experience there and how it's influenced you. It was interesting when I was finding out myself and doing research that they've got a museum and everything there and the cafe is still there and they still get tourists. It's a fantastic place. I would urge anybody that ever comes to Carnforth, there's two places worth going to see. One is Carnforth Bookshop, which I have to give a big plug to because it's a brilliant bookshop. It's got secondhand books and it's an independent bookshop that sells new books. But also the Carnforth Railway Station has this wonderful Brief Encounter Museum, which has a lot of things about World War II. So anybody who's interested in World War II, lots of things to see there. It shows the film on a loop, which is with little cinema seats that you can sit in so you can watch Brief Encounter. And it also has a sort of photography exhibition and the cafe, which is as it was when it was filmed there. And that's the refreshment room where there are quite a few iconic scenes in the actual Brief Encounter film, and which I used again in the book because I wanted to try for my book to mimic the feeling of the film. I think partly because... It was such a different era, although it's not very long ago. It was very class-ridden. The film was quite sort of dark and grainy. And I wanted to try and get that feel a bit, if I could. And that repressed stiff upper lip that was sort of such a part of the English psyche then. And it's loosened off a lot now. I think with our connection to the rest of the world, particularly the US, we've got much more relaxed. But then... We were quite uptight and I wanted that flavour to come out in the book. So yes, I did watch the film a lot and I'd urge anybody who comes to Carnforth to go to the museum and look at the exhibition. There's obviously this, this other thread we should explore further with Peter. You mentioned earlier about the shame that came with the prisoners of war because, you know, obviously mm. they haven't been fighting as much as they were expected to, I suppose you could say. What was the reception of prisoners of war when they came home? They were glad they were home, obviously. People were glad to get them home. But there's always a slight sense that they'd failed, that they were not the medal winners. They were not the people who were going to be glorified for having done anything bold and brave. They were, if you like, the defeated. They'd also undergone terrible 
deprivation, torture, all sorts of things had happened to them while they were prisoners of war. And I think they were not welcomed in the same way as victorious troops, for example. In a way, it was better to have died than to have been a prisoner of war. And I think that was something that people who'd been prisoners of war certainly had difficulty sharing. I know somebody who lived next door to a prisoner of war and said they didn't come out of their house for years afterwards because they were ashamed. I think it's interesting. I haven't had concrete evidence except from uh, testimonies of prisoners of war, which are from the BBC People's War website and other documents that I found through JSTOR and other academic places. But it's very difficult to gauge exactly what the reaction was. But that was what the prisoners of war felt. What other people felt, I haven't found any recording of that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a very sad story about the neighbour there. Mm. Yeah, having gone through so much. Yes, I think it's hard to be a hero if you haven't, you know, if you've been locked up and digging turnips for the Germans for five years. <laughs> it's hard to feel like you're a hero when other people are coming back and saying, you know, how many enemies they'd shot or whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, part of Peter's narrative includes Lambsdorff. Could you tell us about that? Yes, I mean, Lambsdorff is a prisoner of war camp which is in Silesia in Poland. I think it turned into Stalag 8B or something like that. They kept changing the names as things moved around. And it was a place of freezing conditions, mud, and people were housed in barracks where they were sleeping two or three to a bunk. And it was a place where enemy prisoners of war, British and other prisoners that the Germans had taken, were kept really to do work for the Germans. So some of the things they did were things like building a railway track from a quarry, which involved hard labour, shifting railway sleepers, digging rocks, all in sub-zero temperatures with hardly any food. And if you didn't do what the Germans told you to do, then you were subject to beatings and bullying. Basically, it was grim. And the little section I read was when they were just about to be taken away from that to march on the Long March, which was a march that took people all the way towards Germany from Poland as the Red Army were advancing. So I think one of the things that I found really fascinating was that when your rights and your will to do anything for yourself have been removed, then it's very easy to get institutionalised and they had no say in where they went. So a lot of people towards the end of the war were mobilised from their camps and taken on this long march, which was basically a death march. They were marched with not the proper equipment, no coats in sub-zero temperatures. Lots of them died. If they got behind, they'd be shot. It was quite moving and quite dreadful, really, what they went through. There's actually a very good film called The Long March, which describes this. So if you've got access to your YouTube, you can find a clip of it. It's well worth looking at. It's quite well made. Mm -hmm. It's a horrific situation. When you hear about it, with any context removed, you might think, okay, prisoner of war, well, at least they're not on the front line. But the realities of it, it's difficult to comprehend. Mm, I think one of the things that I found most interesting about all the testimonies I read from people who'd been in prisoner of war camps was that the friendship between the men was the thing that enabled people to survive. And in fact, that's what drives past encounters is the friendship between Peter and Archie, who is only 17 years old when he first joins up and ends up in a prison of war camp with Peter, who's a slightly older man, and takes him under his wing because he thinks he won't survive. And I don't think he would have survived if it hadn't been for Peter's looking after him. And this friendship which they kept secret after the war because they didn't want to talk about their experiences, drives the scenes in the prisoner of war camp and on the death march. And to me, that's what means that it isn't unremittingly bleak because there's always the triumph of the human spirit over these conditions. And mostly that triumph comes from having some support, some human support, some other people who are going through what you're going through, 
somebody to laugh a joke with. And another thing that impressed me was the amount of black humour that there seemed to be uh, in the testimonies that I read. So if somebody died, you took their boots and you were grateful for the fact they'd given you their boots. But people could joke about it and say, you know, oh, they're not the right size or things like that, because it was the only way they could survive, really, was through friendship and through camaraderie. Mm -hmm. Well, on a completely different subject, you have the trial and execution of Ruth Ellis mentioned in the story, mentioned, I think, twice. Ruth Ellis was the last woman to be given capital punishment in Britain. Why was it important to include this? What I wanted to include this for was because it highlighted Rhoda and Peter's attitude towards death and punishment. And their attitudes were completely different because of what they'd been through in the war. I think we forget that in 1955, it's only 10 years since the war. And suddenly there's this very public trial of a woman who's going to be hanged for shooting her lover. And there must have been lots and lots of men and women who'd either had an affair, which Ruth Ellis had done, and this had led to her shooting the character, or they were men who'd come back from the war and had to shoot people. And so the trial had taken on for me a sort of, uh, if you like, an interest because of the fact that people's past or recent past would really impact on what their view was on whether the person should be hanged or not. So in the book, Rhoda is saying, oh, they can't hang her, they shouldn't be doing it. Surely there must be a compassionate way. She was the person who was sympathising with Ruth Ellis. Peter, on the other hand, he'd come from a situation where they had had to kill. And the guilt of that was enormous. The enormous weight of having removed somebody from the planet made him much more sympathetic to the idea that she should she should hang. And also, he was sympathetic because so many men had been away from home and were reliant on their girlfriends or their wives, faithfulness while they were away. And this was a big theme in Brief Encounter as well. The, the wife, while you were away at war, had to be faithful. That was her duty, to be faithful. And yet to the wife, that was just very difficult to do. So that was why I wanted to include it. And also, it sort of enabled me to look again at how we punish people differently in peacetime than we do people in wartime. Mm -hmm. It was a striking piece of context, I think, especially in the terms of where the decades had changed. Mm. And I think uh, as well, it shows how much we have moved on as a society, that this is not something we do. And this was the last time we did it. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. We better get on to the occupation, I think. Right. And you have a reading for us. I do, yes. And I'm reading right from the beginning of the book. Just to give a little bit of context, Celine has been married to somebody who she calls Fred, who's actually a German called Siegfried Huber. And they've lived on Jersey for a long time since they've been married. And he's a baker and owns a bakery. And it starts in May 1940. And this is Celine's point of view. At the sharp tingling of the bakery door, I turned down the wireless, which was always on now, so we could keep track of the hostilities between England and Germany. And I looked up to see who the customer was. Morning, Celine. The postman, Ernest Jones, a farmer's son with a ruddy, perspiring face, dumped the letters on the counter next to the till and waved as he breezed out again with another jangle from the bell. Is that the post? Fred emerged from the bakehouse, still in his flowered apron and the white cloth cap that made him look like a friendly convict. He slapped his palms together and released a cloud of white dust before giving me a quick cuddle, pressing me to his broad chest. Leave off, you'll cover me in flour, I said, smiling and hugging him back. Bet it's another order from the Marine Hotel for our Viennese pastries, he said, wiping his hands down his apron. Might stop you eating them, I said pinching at the soft flesh at his waist. You love me, really, he said. Good to have a bit of padding. He sifted through the mail, dividing it neatly into orders and bills. Then he stopped, his fingers frozen in the act of picking up a brown envelope. What's that? I asked. Just a bill, I expect. He hurried away into the back of the bakery. I paused, aware of a tightness 
in the pit of my stomach. But I carried on stacking the loaves into the wooden crates for the hotels on the seafront. When Fred came back, his rosy face had drained to grey. Another jangle. Old Mrs Hedges from the haberdashery just down the road bustled in, coming to collect her brown loaf. We're closed, Fred said. Closed? Mrs Hedges blinked behind her thick tortoiseshell glasses. But the sign in the window says closed. Fred turned the sign around and held open the door. But what about my bread? You'll just have to come back later. But didn't you hear? His sharp tone made me frown. Mrs Hedges backed uncertainly out of the door, an expression of disbelief on her face. Neither of us had ever heard my husband be so rude before. Fred? I put a hand to his arm. You'd better come through to the back. He stripped off his apron and stared at it a moment before hanging it on the peg. Is it bad news? Is it your parents? Is he all right? Everyone was calling the war with Germany the phony war because so far it seemed to be all talk. I followed him through to the sitting room and perched myself on the arm of the easy chair. Fred didn't sit, but he paced, gripping his head in his hands. What is it? What's going on? Was it that letter? He nodded miserably. I've been conscripted. I have to leave for army training next week. What? But they're demilitarising us. That's what Churchill said, that Jersey's too small to be any use to the Germans. She don't understand. Show me. Show me the letter. I pushed my glasses further up my nose. He handed it over. He was still speaking, but I heard nothing he said. The brown piece of paper I was holding had an eagle and a swastika on it. The long German words preceded a space where his name had been typed. Siegfried Huber. A wave of something cold sluiced over me. No. My voice was a whisper. He looked at me. I'll be fighting for the Germans. I stood up, my knees shaking. No, you're not going. You must refuse. I can't refuse. If I refuse, they'll just send someone to arrest me. You've not been back to Germany for years. You're a baker, a master baker, for God's sake, not a soldier. It's madness. If I don't report, they'll court-martial me anyway and throw me in prison. Look at all this small print. He held out an accompanying document printed in small type. The letter says I'm to leave within two days. Report to the German command at Cherbourg. Commandant Zweig. We'll go somewhere. Anywhere. Don't be ridiculous. Where would he hide? It's a small island. Everyone knows me and... Exactly, exactly. You're not German anymore. You live here, on Jersey. My voice rose in panic. He put a hand on my shoulder. I'm German, Celine. It's no use pretending I'm not. Germany's a part of me. Ever since war was declared, I've been thinking of my mother and my father in their little house in Dortmund and whether they're all right. Every time I read a paper saying the British are going to bomb the Ruhr, I feel my insides grow hot and my blood boil because whatever your English papers might say, it's not just industry in the Ruhr. I know it. I grew up there and it's houses and schools and hospitals. It's factories like my father's engineering works and they're all full of people. My people, he said sadly, my school friends, my teachers, my parents. Don't you see? I must do it for them. That madman, Hitler? No, of course not for him. His eyes couldn't meet mine. It's complicated. Germany's my childhood, my school days, the smell of pine logs burning and the taste of my mother's cooking, my homeland. Who wouldn't want to protect that? And you choose that over me, over us? He pulled me to his chest, gripping me tight and speaking over my head. I've worried about it for a long time. It's nearly driven me mad wondering what you'd say when the summons came. What? I pushed him away. You mean you knew it was coming? They wrote to me once before, beginning of last year. I panicked because I thought they might deport me. So I was relieved. And I didn't tell you then because Germany wasn't actually at war with England. And once we were, I thought the war would be short and it'd be over by the time my papers came. He rubbed a hand through his hair. And I knew how I felt that I'd have to go and I didn't know what you'd say. Oh, Fred, 
I sighed and shook my head. You said we'd never keep secrets. I thought it better to keep quiet than to hurt you. I just can't siphon the German out of myself. It's part of me, like Jersey's part of you. But how on earth will I manage without you? Albert will do the baking. He's learnt a lot since he started and he's old enough for the responsibility. And besides, I won't be away for long. The war will be over soon and then I'll be home again and we'll be back to how we were. I shuddered. The war didn't seem real, not here in my sitting room. The thought of it being over was no comfort either because someone would have to lose and one of us would be the loser. I've read that this book started out as two novellas. It did start off as a novella, yes. I grouped together with a group of other historical fiction authors to do a short story for something called The Darkest Hour, which was an anthology of World War II stories. And the occupation began as just Celine's story and Fred's story wasn't in it. But the whole time I was writing it, I kept thinking, I want to write Fred's story. So after the story had been out and been in the anthology a while, I thought, well, I'm going to flesh it out and make it into a whole book. Partly because one of the things that fascinated me about the occupation or the idea of occupation is how does it feel from both sides? How does it feel when you're being occupied? And what does it feel like when you're the person that's giving those orders? How does it feel to actually occupy somebody else's territory? So that's why I developed both Fred's story and Celine's story. And then I had to go back and rewrite the beginning of the book so that we could get a bit more of Fred near the beginning and then try and weld the stories together near the end. It really only comes towards the end of the book that you really see how fragile territories are. But at the end of the book, when the order is given to the Germans to retreat, the day before they're still locking people up and they're still deporting people to concentration camps. And then one day later, because of a paper signed miles away, they're getting on boats and leaving and the territory is no longer theirs. And it's so fragile, that territorial ownership. That bit was just absolutely bonkers to read, that you know they're coming and they're like hours away and it's still happening. Yes, for me that scene was very important, the fact that the person, the German who's in control, and she says, can't you let us off because the British are coming and they'll be here tomorrow. And he said, well, if I let people off today, then why haven't I let them off the day before or the day before that or the day before that? Orders are there because they help preserve that. I found out something that I didn't know until I'd read the book and it was fascinating. You had a specific inspiration for Selina Rachel's story. Yes, I did. Well, first of all, I was interested in Jersey and Guernsey, the Channel Islands, because they were the only British soil occupied by the Nazis. It's so close to home. But the thing that interested me most was I found an article about a woman on Jersey who shielded her friend, who was a Jewish girl, from the Nazi deportations. It was, I think, 18 months that they that they managed to get away with this. This is where also the inspiration for Fred came from because she, Dorothea Weber, she was called, she was married to a German and he did have to go and fight for the Germans. So that was very interesting. But then she also shielded this Jewish lady called Hedwig Bersu. And I researched and looked into that, finding as much information as I could. And fortunately for me, Dorothea Weber had recently been awarded a a medal for her work in protecting this Jewish lady. So there was quite a lot about her on the internet that I could tap into and find sources for. Mm -hmm. Well, you've got Rachel, the Jew, in the book. She's quite a particular character in context. I know I found her personality and coping methods took a little bit of getting used to because they're kind of maybe not what you would expect, at least not looking back, I think. What were your thoughts when you were creating her? I think I wanted to make a big contrast between Rachel and Celine. At the beginning of the book, Rachel is the daredevil. She's the one who's very keen on not having any rules or regulations. She doesn't want to get married. She's a bit disparaging of Fred and Celine's cosy marriage. And she's a bit of a wild person to begin with. And I wanted her to contrast with Celine, who was very much a timid person who wouldn't really go out of her way to do anything that would upset the authorities. 
And of course, through the book, Celine becomes the one who is taking all the risks and Rachel becomes the one who has to be looked after. And of course, she doesn't like being looked after. I think when you're stuck in a situation with somebody that you maybe wouldn't have chosen to live with, their faults and and the way they are become much more hard to deal with and difficult to navigate. And I don't think Rachel was the easiest of guests because she didn't want to be there, but she was forced to be there. There was no way she could be anywhere else. It was interesting, in the actual article that I read about Hedwig Bersu, she fakes her own suicide in order to escape from the Germans. And so I included this as something that Rachel did. So that after that, of course, she, she's on the run and she has to hide out in various outhouses. I wanted to make her not an easy guest. You bring in Hedwig there again. And I think we can probably do this without spoilers. There is something in Rachel's narrative near the end. And we finish the book without knowing. And it's kind of left open. And I know I'm there going, oh, I hope that happens. And in Hedwig's situation... You've got the continuation of this thread. I'm hoping you're picking up what I'm meaning so I don't have to spoil the book. Yes, I am. Yes. Brilliant. So would you say that Rachel has that ending as well? I think so. I think the thing is that there's another character called Wolfgang who is one of the German occupying forces. And because of something that happens early in the book, Rachel becomes very close to him. And in the real story, which I've sort of taken and fictionalised, they keep alive by finding food in different ways. And one of the ways is they become very close to a German soldier who helps them. So not all Germans are bad. As, you know, that's, uh, people are just people. So there are always sympathetic characters as well. And Wolfgang is one of these. And he's quite a mover in the terms of the plot, in that without him, they couldn't have survived. So as well as the occupation forces causing death and destruction and difficulties. They're also the cause of saving both Rachel and Celine until the very end of the war. And Wolfgang is that, takes on that role. What I think is quite sad is that obviously at the end of the book, he's one of the occupying forces that has to then leave. I won't tell you how that pans out for Rachel. I'll leave you to uh, read the book and find out. I think we managed that, that was good. And I know, again, we're, we're going to have to be careful here. So I'm going to do the brief bit and, and you can take it where you want for us. You've got the ending and it's very in context. But some readers may think, oh, that's not the ending I was expecting. So if I just say, how did you come to write the ending as you did? I think one of the reasons that I wrote the ending as I did is there are multiple difficulties with people confronting their past. So, for example, what would happen if when Fred comes home and finds that his brother has been living in his house? So I had to consider what outcomes might come of that and before writing the ending. And I think also it's tempting to want to sugarcoat the war in a way that is not helpful so i didn't want it to end up being a situation where everybody always gets what they want because war isn't like that but at the same time i did want to leave a hopeful ending i didn't want people to come away from the book feeling depressed or think it's a depressing ending so i have left some parts open but with hints and other parts are definitely closed yeah, I think if you read the book, you'll understand why that's so. It's probably very complicated trying not to give anything away because these are all characters that you're rooting for in some way, except Horse. I don't think anybody's rooting for him. But, you know, you want to know what's going to happen to them and you want to know what the future is going to be. And yes, it's quite hard to navigate around that. Well, have we done it all right? Are you OK to keep that question? Yeah, answering? yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think as long as it makes people want to read the book, I think that's that's all right. Oh, I hope so. I hope so. It's a very good book. We should move on now. Tell us about The Lifeline. OK, so The Lifeline is the third of my World War II books. And again, what I found really enjoyable to write in the other two was to write from both a man's and a woman's point of view. 
and actually that's been really nice in terms of my readership because it's expanded my readership to include quite a few more men which has been great actually so the story is about a woman teacher called Astrid in Nazi occupied Norway when the Nazis take over they insist that all teachers should teach their curriculum which is quite a fascist curriculum and replace all their books with fascist propaganda and they refuse the teachers refuse and it's one of the great incidents in Norwegian history of passive resistance and not very many people know about it so that's one of the threads Astrid is is a teacher and she's in this rebellion against the Nazis but of course it gets a bit hot to handle so she ends up having to go on the run and the parallel story that runs with that is that her boyfriend at the beginning of the book is called Jorgen and he is a radio operator for the resistance and he's been trained in England but again he gets discovered and he has to go on the run. He ends up in Shetland and he trains with a group of people who are organising this series of boats that go across from Shetland to Norway to take arms and resistance to the Norwegian resistance movement and so he starts to work for the Shetland bus and It becomes a bit of a rescue operation in that he has to go and rescue Astrid from Norway. And to do that, it involves crossing the North Sea, mountainous seas, ice, lots and lots of enemy fire. Into this mix, there's another character called Carl Brevik, who is a spy, basically. So will Jorgen manage to rescue her or not? And what will happen? Well, this is out in January. It's out in January, 5th of January, yes. Fantastic. And that's great to hear you've got more male readers now. Yes, and I I think you only sort of know it when you see them sign up for your mailing list and see that they've got male names. (laughs) And so you think, oh, that's great. I have actually got some male readers as well as female readers. I think part of it is that my 17th century books tend to have covers which have got women in big frocks. And so that can be a bit off-putting, although all those books have got male protagonists in as well but it's just the way they sell those books they seem to always have these costume drama type of people on the front i will include a list of your 1600s books in the podcast description for anyone who wants to check them out i have paused for now because i'm reading another book for another podcast but i'm going back to it at christmas i'm reading the gilded lily and it's very very fun that's good they're like your baby when you're writing them but then as soon as they're out on the shelves you sort of forget about them so when you said you were going to do a podcast about past encounters I was thinking oh what was that about I had to go back <laughs> I'm glad you remember because it is your highest rated book on Goodreads past encounters oh is it so, okay. yes I believe so yeah <laughs> okay yeah well that's interesting people said oh no no there's no market for World War Two. that was then of course it's a massive market for World War Two now fantastic okay So, listeners, Past Encounters and the Occupation are out now and look out for the lifeline in January. Links to purchase the books are in the description. If you have enjoyed our conversation, do subscribe to the podcast for future episodes. And if you want to contact me, as usual, email address is in the description as well. Deborah, this has been wonderful having you on. and It's been a lot of fun, uh, obviously, despite the, the subjects. It has been really fun talking to you about your books. And, yeah... Thank you very much for being on. And thank you. Due to Christmas busyness for everyone and things in the UK, which I believe is known everywhere, we will be skipping over the next episode slot in the schedule and starting again on Monday the 11th of January 2021. See you then. The Wormhole Podcast episode 28 was recorded on the 21st of November and published on the 14th of December 2020. Music and production by Charlie Place.